Um, I'm Andy Agafangelo, the founder of the Transparency Task Force. Uh, the Transparency Task Force is based in the UK, but is becoming increasingly international. Uh, we are what we call in the, U in the UK a certified social enterprise, which basically means that we exist not to make profit, but to make an impact. And the impact that we want to make is to help reform the financial services sector. Uh, to be more precise, what we want to do is to promote ongoing reform of the financial sector so that it serves society better. Or to put it another way, we want the financial industry to be more transparent, more truthful, more trustworthy. Uh, we think it's a long way from being those three things. And we believe there's a lot of work that needs to be done to change the way that it functions. So we believe that we are quite a purposeful organization. Uh, we're pretty serious about the work that we do. Uh, we operate in a pretty collegiate way, but we are happy to challenge the industry and the regulators and the politicians when, when necessary to do so. I'll talk to you first of all, ladies and gentlemen, about our, our volunteer network. Um, because our volunteer network is growing quite quickly. And I'm going to put a few ideas to you during the course of this evening session. Uh, oh, sorry, this evening, it is evening UK time. It's 11 p.m. here. It's not quite so late for you guys and girls, obviously. Um, but uh, we, we do have a, a, a few particular ideas in mind. So um, what we're going to do is talk to you about the team that we currently have. And after we've got these preliminaries out of the way, we'll deal with some... Um, We'll deal with some introductions and then we'll head off into the actual program itself. So here's the Transparency Task Force team. Uh, the actual kind of employed team is myself, Tina, Alexandra. You've all had interaction with Alexandra, of course, over the last few days. Uh, Chelsea, Bryony, Charlotte. Uh, we've now got Jude, who started recently, just last week, and Jordan, who started uh, this week. Alex Varley Winter is one of our volunteers. Now, everybody else on this web page is a volunteer. Uh, they're mostly based in the UK, but we're getting more and more people operating uh, for us outside the UK. They all do different things. Uh, they all do things that they want to do, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it, I guess. Um, and some of them volunteer quite literally just one hour per month. I'll, I'll come back to this gentleman shortly. I'll come back to Ian Veach for a reason quite shortly. Uh, from one hour a month to, you know, four, five, ten, maybe more. Um, it really entirely depends on the individual. So in the interest of transparency, I'll make it very clear to all of you that we are looking for people to volunteer in Canada uh, because there is a particular project we have on the go that we believe is an important initiative that you could all help with a great deal quite easily without even leaving the comfort of your own homes. So I'll come back to exactly what that is in a, in a short while. We're hoping that by the end of the year, we may well have perhaps 100 volunteers around the world, um, but we're a long way away from that. So hopefully some of you good folk might volunteer to help the Transparency Task Force uh, as a result of this evening's, sorry, today's uh, today's session. And I, I, quite, I mean it quite literally, if you've got one hour or more per month that you can volunteer for the Transparency Task Force, please do so. I mentioned Ian Veach. Um, Ian Veach volunteered roughly six months ago to lead a very important project for us. He's a lovely gentleman. He's, uh, he's based in Dublin, uh, but most of his working career has had a very, very international dynamic to it. So he understands a lot of things about the way the financial industry works in different countries. And he's involved with what we call our Mind Map Initiative, our VIP mind map initiative and our vip mind map initiative is all about something that we call our strategy for driving change i'm going to explain that our strategy for driving change very simply is about bringing together the thinking of two types of people on one hand there are those that we characterize as having the uh, a sense of uh, uh, pride passion for the changes that we want to see and also uh, the other type of people who have what we call uh, the power and the position to make change possible. The one group have the sense of uh, uh, pride and purpose for the change we want to see. The other have the sense of power and position. 
And what we're doing is we are identifying the people around the world who have a position of influence in the way the financial system works. And we've got a, a lovely group of people involved in this project today. I'll show you who they are. If I can invite you all, please, just to make sure, make sure you're on mute so that we, we minimize any background noise whilst the other folks are speaking. I think we've got one or two noisy backgrounds. There we go, I think I found it. Okay, so let me explain what, uh, who's involved with this project already. Um, what you're looking at right now is a piece of software, a very good, simple, usable piece of software. It's very useful for creating mind maps. And this is the group of people who are already involved in the project that Ian is leading. Um, so here's Ian Veach. Uh, for the UK arm of this activity, we have a gentleman called Scott Housley, Steve Hubbard, John Martin, Philip Hack. We've got Amrick in for France, George Melman for USA, Mushir Ahmed for Hong Kong. Australia, we've got three people, Nigel Bradshaw, Harry Shimei, Bernard Thompson. And in Belgium, we have Jacina Cameron. You'll notice we don't yet have anybody for Canada. And that's what we want. We want one or two or three or four or five or 10 people in Canada to give us a little bit of help with something that is very difficult for us to do in the UK, but quite easy for people to do in Canada. I'm now going to briefly explain what it is. We are building a mind map in each country that we have an interest in. So that's UK, Canada, right across Europe, Australia, um, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, and of course, Canada. Um, and what we're doing is we're identifying who the key people are in the different areas of industry within each country's financial services sector. So who are the most important regulators? Who are the people that run the central banks? Who are the policymakers? Who are the important journalists? Who are the people that run the major asset management firms or mutual funds or insurance companies or banks? Uh, who are the leading academics that have an interest in the financial sector? Who are the authors that write books about the financial sector? And, and the reason we're doing this, ladies and gentlemen, is because having identified who the important people are in each country, we then are reaching out to them explaining our point of view about the idea that the financial services sector needs to be positively reformed. And that brings us close to the people that have the influence to change the way the system works. Now, you know that today's um, event is entitled, uh, well, it's all about reforming the financial system in Canada. To reform the financial system in Canada, we need to be able to influence the people that have influence over the financial system in Canada. Now, I'm a realist, I'm a pragmatist. We're a long, long way away from being able to do that right now, but it's not impossible for us to do in Canada, collectively, what we are definitely managing to do in the UK. So I'll briefly talk about the UK. Uh, over the last six years, we've managed to open two government inquiries, one on the issue of hidden costs and charges, in pensions and investments, a very big topic. And we've also opened a, an inquiry with the British government about the problem to do with pension scams. We also run two all party parliamentary groups. We respond in a pro-consumer manner to many kinds of regulatory consultations. And we also give evidence direct to parliament. So for example, yesterday, myself and one of my colleagues in the Transparency Task Force, Mark Bishop, we were both quite literally giving evidence to a lawmaking session in Parliament via Zoom because of the COVID, um, all about reforms needed to do with compensating victims of particular scams. We've uh, appeared on the front page of the Financial Times, we're regularly quoted in the trade press, we're often in the national newspapers, we've been on the main national radio station four times, TV a couple of times on CNBC. So I know it's quite difficult to imagine Transparency Task Force Canada having any real influence over your system at all, but it's from my point of view just a matter of time before we do that. Um, Canada's a long way behind our involvement in other countries. If I take, for example, uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, we've already had some influence in that area, uh, quite a bit of activity in the US. Uh, Canada is an area we haven't really, or a country we haven't really focused on before, but tonight's all about changing that.
The last thing I'm going to talk about before we go to inviting everybody to introduce themselves are our groups. <clears throat> the very first ever group that we had was all about costs and charges and investments. It was the lack of transparency on costs and charges and investments that brought about the creation of the Transparency Task Force. I ran our first ever event on the 7th of October 2015, all about this issue. Uh, people came up to me afterwards, told me that they kind of get what we're trying to do and wanted to volunteer to help. So we created a group of volunteers. Now we have 25 groups of volunteers and over 3,000 people in the world involved with our activity. Uh, roughly 2,000 in the UK, the rest spread across Europe, Canada, USA, Australia, South Africa, Hong Kong, Singapore. Now, it may well be that one or more of these groups in some way relate to you. For example, the financial planning group I know is going to be relevant to some of you. The group on investments is relevant to others. The group on pensions is relevant to others. And tomorrow, what you'll all get is a, a follow-up email from my colleague Alexandra, who, amongst many other ideas she'll put to you in her email, will invite you to select whichever groups you want to be a part of. And she'll point you, point you to this web page, which, um, which, which tells you more about the groups. The reason this quotation is here um, is because it really captures the essence of our belief system. And our belief system is summarized so nicely by this pretty famous quotation from Margaret Mead. I'll make it a bit bigger so you probably can't see it. The quotation is, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. We believe that to be true. We believe it to be true that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. And each one of our 25 groups is like a mini campaign engine, focusing on particular issues. Each one has got a clear campaign objective and each one is quite serious about trying to make things different. I'm also going to show you one more page, which is our ambassadors network. Uh, we have, as I said, uh, 3000 people around the world involved in what we do. Roughly, roughly 10% of our members, and it'll never be more than that, 10% um, of our members are what we call our ambassadors. These are individuals who are particularly strongly aligned with our purpose, our mission, our vision, people that really identify with what we do, that we also in turn uh, relate, respect, and uh, want to have involved as closely as possible in our work. We've only got a few in Canada, but the people we've got in Canada are, are, are you know, absolutely, absolutely awesome. So I'll, I'll click on the Canada bit just to show you. Larry Elford, who um, is, is very focused on the issue of a lack of transparency on costs and charges and investments. Um, he's written books about the topic, etc. Larry Bates also very focused on the lack of transparency on costs and, and investments. Uh, Paul Bates, who's with us this evening, our first speaker. Paul will be speaking after we've completed the introductions round. Uh, Paul has been a wonderful, wonderful friend to the Transparency Task Force. It's very obvious to us, he really does know his stuff. And he's very happy for us to pick his brains and get his thoughts on various legal matters around the issues that we're concerned with. And John DeGoe, he's not with us tonight. Uh, he's, a, he's a financial planner with, uh, with Wellington Altus. And I think that's it. So as well as being keen to grow our network of members in Canada, we're also keen to grow our ambassadors. And as I hope you've all understood, we're also very, very keen to grow our volunteer network in, in Canada, particularly in relation to that mind map initiative. In plain English, all that's about is you helping us understand who the regulators are, who the central banks are, who the key policy makers are, who the important relevant politicians are, etc. It's easy for you to do that. It's a bit like building a jigsaw puzzle this. You've all got a few different pieces of that jigsaw puzzle. Together we can build it. Once we build it, we can create a strategy for outreach, get the politicians involved with our work, get the policy makers involved with our work, etc, etc, etc. Frankly, we're just copying what we know has already worked very, very well in the UK. 
Okay, I'm really pleased you're all here with us. Thank you very much indeed. Could I please invite those of you who haven't yet put your uh, video on to do so because we're going to go through the introductions round. Uh, can I please invite you just to briefly introduce yourselves, briefly introduce yourselves. Um, so just who you are, what part of Canada you're in, um, what you do. And if you don't mind, it's a suggestion, but you don't have to do this. If you don't mind, what would be the one thing about the Canadian financial system that you could change, you would change if you wanted to, or if you could, if you had a magic wand, so to speak, what would be the one thing that you changed? And don't worry if nothing comes to mind, that's fine. We'll just move on. But please keep these introductions and comments reasonably short. I hope everyone's happy. Um, we'll, uh, once we've completed the, um, the round of introductions, we've got Paul Bates, then Ken Kavenko, then Mike Heal. Um, we'll have lots of discussion along the way. It's all about sharing our thoughts and ideas. And uh, that's what that's that's how we work. I hope you hope you all enjoy the session. I certainly am looking forward to it myself. So let's go to. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Should it be Igor or Igor? I'm sure you'll tell me. Igor Zaks. Uh, I work for a company uh, that they started named Tenza. Uh, so I actually spent most of my financial career in UK before mm -hmm. moving to Canada about four years ago. So I know like both markets quite well. Right. Uh, uh, for, uh, for, for us, we focus on everything related to trade finance. We work on restructuring projects. We also work on operational due diligence. Uh, and I get education in both countries. So I've done London Business School and I've done the Law School of University of Toronto. Very interesting. And I'm based you. in Toronto. Uh, oh, to your question about what I think is uh, uh, one thing here, I think, you know, comparing with, for example, UK, we get uh, the banking system is a bit more protected and uh, less competitive and what? that's uh, that's uh, have impact on uh, how competitive will be the offerings and how uh, good it will be but the same applied to say utilities and things like it so the system is a bit more uh, in my view and it has its advantages i'm not saying it's always negative but it's one thing that definitely was looking at and thinking you know how it can be improved or what can be done Thank you very much indeed, Igor. Thank you very much indeed. We've got us off to a great start. We'll now go to Ed Tuhig, who's uh, a regular at our events. Ed, as always, it's very lovely to see you, sir. Looking particularly smart this evening, if you don't mind me saying so, Ed. <laughs> so, so please introduce yourself and share with us your thought about if there was one thing you can change about the financial system in Canada, what would it be, Ed? What would it be? Okay, I'm Ed Tuhig. I'm uh, living in, on the East Coast in Nova Scotia. And my interest was first started by looking at accounted to taxation, which interested me. And it developed into looking at the macro economics and the, and the, and of uh, everywhere. And uh, I believe that the financial system, the main thing that has to be changed is that there has to be the changes in the tax act, which taxes now the working people whereas the people in the financial sector, which produces no goods and services and nothing for the small man, are the people who are getting all the tax advantages. So I believe there is a big movement that has to be made to put taxation in the place it should be as a social service, not a money raising uh, facet of, uh, of government. So I hang along and listen to this financial sector talk and uh, feel that there has to be major changes in the financial sector. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Ed, for your very full answer. That's lovely. Wonderful. Michael Topolinski, I hope I've done a reasonable job of that, sir. Uh, please introduce <laughs> okay. yourself, pronounce your surname properly for me, and then go into yeah. uh, what you think about what needs sure. to be. Sure. Top Topolinski, that's pretty good. Topolinski. Okay. Um, from Toronto originally, spent most of my career abroad and just recently moved back to Toronto. I have a, a background in political philosophy and an MBA from INSEAD and I've been doing change management and for, for senior executives and investors all around the world for large, large corporations. And I guess I'm interested in the topic for political philosophy reasons, really, justice reasons and things like this. Uh, and risks of uh, backlash from society, if you don't get this right. Uh, the thing that I'm keeping an eye on in Canada, which is we're seeing some movement on, but it's slow, is 
disclosure of beneficiary ownership of our uh, limited companies and other kind of legal entities. Oh, wow. we're, uh, we're a hotbed of uh, money laundering uh, around the world. And it's something we really could close down if we wanted to. Well, if, if that topic's of interest to you, we have an event in September called Turning the Tide on Dirty Money. And uh, I think the UK is very well qualified to talk about <laughs> money laundering. Uh, along, along my career, I, uh, I served some clients in, under, in the Medvedev years in, in Russia and got, got a chance to understand some of the oligarchs that uh, will appear in the press and got an, an understanding of just the volume and with what motivations they're moving gray and dark money around. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> but UK can definitely share some best practices. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We, are, we, are, we, are, we are world class. We're world class in it. Thank you very much, Michael. That was fun. Let's go to Mr. Paul Bates, one of our speakers later. Paul, uh, in a nutshell, uh, who are you? Where are you? What do you do? And also, what would be the one thing you change, Paul, if you could? Hi, Andy. Hi, everybody. It's great to see Ken Kavanko, Canada's most sophisticated retail consumer council, my deeply respect, and so many other familiar faces like Ed and a couple of, well, several new faces. Nice, nice to see you. Um, I'm a Canadian civil litigation counsel who does a great deal of class action plaintiff's work in financial services, as I'll be discussing with you shortly. The one thing I would change is to speed up the justice system and make it really work. That's a little bit off topic, Ken, but I'm good at off topic. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. And I'm always interested when Paul explains that uh, the justice system in the UK is, is even worse. It's particularly hard for people in the UK to get justice because we don't have class action and group action structures. And uh, Paul's very well qualified to talk about that. Thank you, Mr. Bates. Let's go to Michaela. Um, where are you? What do you do? And what would be the one thing you would change, Michaela? Lovely to see you as always, by the way. So I started my career in... Um... I hold a PhD in theoretical physics, if that is. Uh, and I was what, uh, when I switched to finance, I was automatically uh, a quant. I worked in um, product, um, how do I say, valuations. I did teach derivatives. I worked as a risk manager. I implemented uh, risk systems. So I looked at, I worked for several uh, pension plans and um, banks in relation to their uh, risk. Now, um, my interest is really um, into uh, consumer protection and education. There is so little education. And of course, um, a bit toughening up of the regulators. Yeah. Um, it happens that uh, Canada is much less uh, tough than the SEC in the US in the numbers of um, uh, cases they pursue and they uh, convict and uh, yeah. all of that. Thank you very much, Steve. Michaela, for your input. Thank you. We go from Michaela to Mike. Mike's going to be speaking later. Uh, we know Mike through Keith and Bashir. I'm never sure if I know how to pronounce Keith's surname correctly, who is internationally renowned for the work that he does on transparency. And it's great that we've got Mike here speaking later on. Mike, please take the opportunity to introduce yourself and share with us the one thought about what you would change in the Canadian financial system. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. And you did get Keith's name spot, spot on. So, so well done. Uh, I'm, we're based in Toronto, uh, Canada. Uh, we, we benchmark cost and performance for pension funds and sovereign wealth funds uh, around the world. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, I, I have an interest and a lot of experience dealing with one small part of, of the, well, not so small, I guess, but one part of the financial sector. And that's basically mostly large pension funds around the world. And I'm not sure I would change a, a lot about the governance and management of, of large Pension, public pension funds in, in, in Canada. There may be things about the pension sector that systemically that could be could be changed, but I, I, I think I'll sort of twist that that large pension ma management organizations around the world 
could learn something and, and perhaps emulate more uh, the governance structures and, and performance of, of large Canadian public pension systems. Thank you very much, Mike. Lovely. Um, looking forward to your session later, Mike. Thank you. We'll now go to Mr. Ken Kavenko, who the Transparency Task Force has admired for quite some time. Mr. Kavenko, I know it's a challenge, but as well as introducing yourself, please give us the one thing that you would change. I say it's a challenge for you because I'm sure you could read off a very, a very long list of things that need sorting out. We would, I would say there, there are so many issues. Uh, and since Canada doesn't have a national regulator and our banking system is controlled by the banks and each province, you know, does its own thing, it's very, very difficult. Uh, but if I had to say one thing, it would be where we're focused is on the security sector and it would be regulatory enforcement. And the opposite side of that, the other end of it would be the complaint handling. The two together, if we could get those in shape, we might be able to sandwich in the other, the other issues. So that we would see that as the, uh, the number one. And with the aging population, this is a, a top priority for us because uh, I don't have to tell you, vul the vulnerable client is uh, easily exploited. Thanks, Ken. Great to have you with us. Thank you. And thank you very much for being concise. Let's go to Hilliard Macbeth, who we've got to know through a very well recognized and respected uh, economist from down under from Australia. Um, but Hilliard, let's hear from you first of all. Thank you. Sir, uh, Hilliard Macbeth, um, financial advisor, portfolio manager for more than 42 years in, in Canada. And, uh, but also, um, I, wrote three books. So the 1999 book is out of print, but the book, the main book now is called When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash, edition one, 2015, edition two, 2018. And it's still selling quite well, even though my prediction has turned out to be um, what I like to say is early, not wrong, but early. So real estate prices continue to rise in Canada and the, um, in the research for the book and in the book itself, I, I, I turned the research into a chapter and, and the role of the banking system and the role of the insurance provided by the government called CMHC is a major factor. And uh, so uh, but as I learned more and more about banks, I, I learned several things. First of all, most financial analysts, even some very sophisticated ones, do not understand um, the balance sheets or the capital structures of banks very well. The people that work for the banks themselves don't understand it very well. And the concentration in Canada and the finance sector, especially the banking sector, because the banks have the power to create money uh, by making a loan, it's a tremendous amount of power. And uh, somebody's already mentioned, uh, they are not regulated. Um, the, the trend around the world is soft touch regulation and Canada's taking soft touch touch regulation to the extreme. Wow. So the one thing I would change is um, uh, if it was just had to be one thing, it would be, I would remove the government insurance program called the CMHC and that would give the banks and the finance sector um, a completely different look because uh, it would change the relationship between risk and reward and um, guarantees. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Hilliard. Thank you. I'll look into that. That sounds interesting. Mr. Michael Brathwaite. Hi, nice to see you again, Michael. Uh, please introduce yourself and share with us your thought. Hi, um, I'm also in Toronto. However, I recently moved back from Europe. Um, uh, I uh, did an MBA at ESA Business School in Barcelona, and then I was working for Deutsche Bank in their uh, M&A advisory practice for a couple of years. And currently I am with uh, TD Securities in their corporate banking practice. Um, I agree with a lot of the issues that have been raised so far, but my focus, and I, I mentioned this last, last week on the call we had, um, is that uh, most capital for uh, entrepreneurs and um, new ventures is very much, uh, not geared towards certain segments of, um, of, of our society, not geared towards uh, certain populations. So my focus is kind of on um, being able to create, you know, a seed fund or get access to capital for those that traditionally do not have access to it. 
Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Very, very clear indeed. Very clear. Mr. Murray Walker, you're next. Murray Baker, my apologies. Um, yeah, Mur Murray Baker. I'm the manager of financial empowerment for family services in Greater Vancouver. And um, our, our intent really is to educate uh, primarily um, marginalized populations, newcomers, um, about uh, financial products and services and uh, how the investment and banking system works. Um, my background actually is in writing financial books for students. Um, I've written a couple of books on that topic. That was my introduction to the financial uh, empowerment world. Um, one of the, the big changes that I would uh, make in the banking uh, system is, is making it uh, mandatory that the client interest be first in terms of uh, the selling of investment products. Uh, the past couple of years, there's been a number of instances of employees coming forward, um, telling how they were pressured to sell products which were in the interest of the bank, but not necessarily interest uh, in the interest of the uh, clients. And we run into this a lot with our clients. They're sold products that aren't necessarily right for them. Um, they're high fee products. And uh, we've even seen that recently with the increase in bank fees for individuals. And in fact, some, some bank accounts now you can get free banking as long as you have a minimum of a $5,000. Well, that dis disproportionately affects lower income individuals who don't happen to have $5,000 uh, sitting around which they can leave in a bank account. So that really, um, is the focus that I'd like to see is, is really making more transparency and making the client interest first in, in terms of the selling a product. Murray, thank you very much indeed. Well, so much of what you've said aligns so strongly with what the Transparency Task Force is all about. And uh, I, I've made a note to follow, follow up with you separately because we have some ideas about um, the need for education of children. And if you've written books in the past about this very topic, we really ought to be talking to you about it, Murray. Thank you very much for being here. That's great. You, really, really great. Uh, Mr. Burns, your thoughts, please. Thanks, Andy. Good to hear from you again. Uh, it's John Burns. I'm here in Toronto. I, I work as the uh, senior financial planner for the Victims and Vulnerable Persons Divisions under the Attorney General through the Office of the Public Guardian Trustee. I've been in the financial planning sector for over 30 years and I was the founding uh, director for the Financial Planning Association of Canada, where we're trying uh, as best we can to ensure that financial planners take on a fiduciary responsibility when dealing with their clients. Uh, the two key things I, well, I guess the one thing you wanted, Andy, but the, yeah. the areas that <clears throat> I'm most interested in are, first of all, uh, the Title Protection Act, which is going through the state of uh, province of Ontario right now, where uh, it's recognizing financial planning and financial advising as a profession. And therefore, there's going to be regulations as who can call themselves that, which will hopefully bring some clarity. And also uh, continuing on the what they call the CRM2 model, you know, uh, which is, is the disclosure of fees and the underlying costs associated with all the financial products within Canada. So uh, the, on the fee structure and who exactly is uh, being paid and how are they being paid and uh, and 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 who is able to give uh, discretionary or or uh, objective advice for a client? So uh, yeah, and it's uh, it's an ongoing process and we're uh, we're seeing some, uh, but there's a lot of interested people in Canada and there's a lot of motivation. So it's uh, great that uh, I was able to jump in tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you very much indeed, John. Um, there's such a great degree of alignment between you all about what matters to you. And um, clearly what matters to you are the sorts of things that matter to us as well. This is great. And, and there are people like you all over the world. Believe me, I, I, I really love my work. And one of the things that's really nice about it is the global or at least the international perspective we have. But the same themes keep coming up time and time again. One of the things we do is respond to industry consultations. Um, roughly nine out of 10 consultation responses that regulators around the world get about financial matters uh, come from uh, industry stakeholders that are essentially trying to maintain the status quo and protect the commercial interests of the major companies. So it's relatively rare for an organization like us 
to put in a good word for the consumer, you know, the actual end user of the products. So we, we make a point of actually um, doing quite a bit of uh, responses to consultations. So if we go to our download section here and our consultation responses section here, uh, you'll see this year so far, we've already in 2021, we've already, already responded to five consultations, including our first outside the UK. It was, um, it was this one here that was all about a piece of legislation happening in Australia. And obviously we go, you know, it goes back quite a while. So if I can ask you, please, if ever there's a financial services regulatory reform consultation happening in Canada, uh, we would love to know about it. Please tell us because we'll get a little team together. We call it a response squad. And these folks would volunteer to work together to write a response uh, for the Transparency Task Force on behalf of the consumer. And we're always guided by what we call our North Star question. And our North Star question is, what is best for the consumer? So thank you for raising that particular point, John. That's great. We'll go to Lynn, then we'll go to Lisa. Uh, so Lynn, then Lisa, then we'll jump into the first speaker that's Paul Bates. Thank you, Lynn. Looking forward to, uh, to learning from all of you that have introduced yourself uh, so far. Uh, so, so many different issues. Um, I'm a financial advisor um, in Cambridge, Ontario. I've been doing that for 25 years. You know, one of one of my themes is um, helping people realize that the way they the way they manage their money reflects their values. So the way they spend, the way they invest, um, even the way they donate their money and how they leave their money behind all uh, reflect their values. So um, that's that's one of my uh, one of my themes. But of course, you know, have uh, over a career of 25 years have touched on uh, all of the different issues that each of you are expressing and representing and um, really looking forward to getting a better understanding of um, all, the, all of the issues and solutions. Very good. Thank you, Thank you ever so much, Lynn. That's lovely. Lisa, if possible, could you uh, share with us your, your introduction and uh, explain the background? I can't quite oh, see right. it. Is it and, and also give us your thought. Thank you, Lisa. I'm Lisa Paston. I'm working in New Westminster, British Columbia, on the with the City of New West. But I'm with the Ministry of Children and Family Development, working on a poverty reduction strategy. So we're looking at all sorts of financial pieces locally. Um, the background is um, I don't know if you heard in the media about the discovery of the 215 um, Indigenous children's bodies in Kamloops. It's very um, horrific and distressing. And this is this, um, a campaign every year, every child matters, where people wear orange shirts. So, yeah, um, my thoughts, uh, just some, maybe some thoughts around the banking charges for um, accounts in Canada. It's always been something I haven't quite understood why the banks are charging their customers to use their banks. Thank you very much indeed, Lisa. And that's an interesting Canadian accent you've got there. <laughs> where, where, where was home for you in the UK? I'm from Chester originally. Chester, lovely place, very lovely place. Thank you, Lisa, for being here. Let's uh, go straight to Mr. Paul Bates. Can I please invite you to put your hands together to welcome Paul? He's spoken at our events on several occasions, and it's always great stuff. So, Mr. Paul Bates, take it away, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to see some BC colleagues present. I've been called to the bar of BC a grand total of two years. It's my favorite place to go to court. And um, I, I had um, prepared to speak with you about um, fees and charges in relation to investment funds, but inspired by some of your introductions, I have to tell you the two reasons I do what I do. And the first one is that at 23 years of age, I took every nickel I had out of my checking account and went and planned to buy an engagement ring. And, and I went down to the bank to get the money order and the manager said, you have, you know, $14 in your account. I said, that can't be right. I was, I was here yesterday. I have 2312 I It took me nine years to save up $2,300. And next thing I know, I was sitting in front of the branch manager in the head office of Scotiabank in Toronto as a young lawyer. And he said, sir, your bank account's been empty. I said, well, sir, it can't be. There must be a mistake. That, that can't be right. And, and I said, when was it emptied and by whom? Here's my bank book 
from yesterday. And he came back, you know, 15 minutes later, no apology whatsoever. We emptied your bank account to play your brother's overdue student loan. What? I said, you what? He said, we've emptied your bank account to play your brother's overdue student loan. I said, listen, I love my brother, but I didn't know what was going on with his student loan. Put my money back. He said, well, we're not going to do it. He says, we're not going to put your money back. You have to pay your brothers. Don't you care for your brother? He's overdue on a student loan. I said, put the money back or I'm going to sue you right now. I'm going to go out of here. I know how to do it. I'm going to do it. And the second thing I'm going to do is phone my father, who's an executive in the executive suite. I said, that's the second thing. First thing I'm going to do is sue you. And at that moment, when that weak need bank manager waddled down the hall to put my money back, I knew there was a reason I wanted to become a litigator. And I never did tell my father till long after he retired, don't take my money. It, it made me mad. Yeah. It took me about 25 years till a very fine Canadian financial executive walked into my office, said, I've received the company's annual report. Read this page. That's illegal. I said, well, why do you say that? He said, that's illegal. And he explained all the legislation to me. I said, you know, it makes sense. But I mean, it's in the annual report of a global, large Canadian financial institution. And I had that inability to accept someone else's answer that didn't make sense to me. I can't accept it. I said, okay, well, well, we'll write them a demand letter and see what they do. And I wrote the chairman of the board. And about nine months later, I got back a letter from Tories that said, we're not going to answer your letter. I said, what do you mean? You're not going to answer the letter. You know, we won't answer your letter. They say they won't answer the letter. So I said, okay, let's sue them. So we sued them. And, and we, we, we were complaining about a transaction that had been approved by two appointed actuaries, two consulting actuaries, the boards of directors of these companies, the superintendent of financial institutions, the minister of finance, and the prime minister of Canada. But we were right. He was right. I became right in the argument. They were wrong. It was illegal. The court set it aside. So I, I never could. You have to have a very rebellious attitude. I might have been a, some 16th century English rebel. But if it doesn't make sense, go after it. That's what I do for a living. And, and you know, honestly, we start some of these cases. They, we, we think they're right. They look right. But I don't know what they're going to say. So I, the, the number one trick of the trade in my job is you know, there's probably 50 good lawyers in Canada who can start the case. The number one trick of the trade is to find out as soon as possible what their answer is. And if they don't give you a good one, press on. If they give you a good one, get yourself out of it fast. Yeah. So I had occasion two or three years ago in dialogues with people like Ken, and actually with Ken and people like Ken, and he's got a, an amazing group of people to become aware of the investment funds industry. Now I have all this in evidence somewhere from top of my head, it's something like two to $3 trillion of savings of Canadians. It, it's, uh, it pays hundreds and hundreds of millions a year in fees for distribution and other expenses. It, it's a big part of the Canadian economy. And um, when, you, when you take a look at what, who, who validates the fees and expenses? What is the protection for investors in relation to fees and expenses? If you investigate that, guess what you find? Number one, there's no board setting rates like the CRTC sets, uh, cell, cell phone plan rates and uh, uh, cable TV charges. There, there's no protectorate approving rates. Energy board sets the energy rates. I've, had occasion to take a look at that process. So there's no such protection for investment fund rates. N number two, the independent review committees, which are uh, established to deal with conflict of interest transactions and otherwise protect unit holders from improprieties, guess what they don't deal with? Fees and most expenses, but not with fees. It's not in their jurisdiction. They don't deal with it. Well, that's interesting. Who protects the investors? Well, the securities commissions won't review for reasonableness fees paid out of investment funds, hundreds and hundreds of millions. I think Ken knows more. It, it may be a billion and a half a year. I'm not sure. They don't look at that either. So, well, what's the protection? So these are big fees. 2% of 
of a $4 billion fund is $80 million a year coming out in fees. And, and it, it, are they charging the fees the way they should be? Well, some people say no, and I happen to be representing a lot of them. So then the obvious thing that some lawyers and the 50 of us who do the work you know, would think about is that investment fund units are, pardon me, are securities. But the securities legislation may be limited. It only covers the purchase of the unit and the disclosure at the time of purchase. It may not, it may not cover the, the lifetime that you hold the unit. And the securities commissions are the ones that approve the disclosure documents. And so if there's problems in them, some of that language comes from the regulator. And some of the language is very problematical because for example, I think it's between 125 and maybe 300 million a year are paid by asset managers to discount brokers for services and advice. Mm. But the discount brokers can't provide advice. So I started a case that no one would start uh, complaining that it's misleading to pay 2% in fees when the manager's paying 1% in distribution commissions for services and advice when there's no advice. And I think it was two, two years ago or roughly that I happened to be sitting across the table from a very senior executive of a bank cross-examining him on his affidavit. And no one could have been more content. King Henry VIII had less enjoyment of the moment of his life than this bank manager. He sat there with his arms folded in great self-satisfaction how Because his point was the language is promoted by the securities regulators. What do you want me to do? I've done nothing wrong. So after a few minutes, this is the tricks of the trade. After a few minutes of making sure he's got loose back and very comfortable in his chair, I, I, I picked a piece of paper up out of my briefcase and, and I said, is that your bank letterhead? Yeah. Do you know this guy at TD Wealth named whatever? And he's actually the top of the bank. Yeah. You don't report to him, do you? Oh, no. I see six or eight levels above you. Oh, yes. So you'll accept what he says to be right, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then, <laughs> sorry, if I was distracted. So then a couple of minutes later, I'm reading to him where the bank pleads with regulators that it be permitted with regulatory changes to charge a 25 basis point fee for uh, distribution. To, to the discount brokers, because the rest is for advice they're not allowed to give. Like, it, like if the plaintiff lawyer got up and worked every day for a week, I couldn't have written a better expression of the complaint than that letter. So that's what we do. So the point is that th there are fees paid for which there is no, uh, sorry, the, the next thing you would expect is that the, the legal documents concerning these fees you know, because they're huge amounts, they might be negotiated, but they're in a category of law calls, any lawyers on the call will know, contracts of adhesion, you, you have no say, you can't change anything, you sign or don't sign, the entire contract documents directed to protecting the bank, and, and finally, you have no power to negotiate the rate, so here's the punchline, the legal justification for the expense out of the fund is disclosure, investors know what they're paying but the disclosure is bad mm. so that's a reason to start a case now guess what someone you may be looking at them noticed well these are trusts you know the law created trusts in medieval times for the wealthy to be able to can protect their wealth after death and designate who's to benefit from their wealth and nothing, nothing in law is more sacrosanct than the duty to the beneficiaries of a trustee. The trustee has a duty of candor. The trustee has to avoid conflicts of interest. The trustee must comply with the trust declaration. I could go on and on. But if you were the plaintiff lawyer wishing for the right legal structure to bring a case, it would be a trust. And it's a trust. And by the time I was starting this case, I just finished a couple of cases to do with real estate investment trusts. I was getting sick of trusts, but the cases went well. And I thought, wow, why isn't anybody looking at this as a trust law problem? So 
when you look at it as a trust law problem and the trustee is paying out, you know, say 100 basis points for what they claim might, might justify 25, but they don't claim to justify the rest, you know, that, that might be offside the law of trust. But then it came to my mind one more. I'm not trying to boast. I'm telling you how cases get going. The, the, that it came to my mind one morning. Well, gee, who's the trustee paying the money to? The trustee's paying the money to itself because the trustee's the manager and the manager arranges the distribution. Like, is that a conflict? If an estate's lawyer paid himself uh, four times what he claims should be given, it's, it's, you know, they'd be disbarred and whatever else would happen to them. So, uh, so anyway, these cases arise now because lawyers of which I'm a, in several groups are entrepreneurial and they're willing to bring cases no one else brought uh, and take the chance. You finance it uh, and you absorb a tremendous you know, economic burden to bring them and you hope to do well uh, and, and uh, see if the court will listen. So uh, I, if, if that's a summary of going from everybody says it's proper what they're doing to maybe they don't like their own legal position anymore uh, and want to buy their way out of it. And they should because they're in a terrible way. And that's just fees for distribution. There are other fees uh, paid out of trusts. Um, as you know, managers in many large cap Canadian equity funds charge two to 225 basis points for uh, strategies uh, in major Canadian equity funds that are duplicative of the index. And so there's about 10 of those started so far or whatever number, I don't count. So this is good. In my view, this is good. This produces the economic and market discipline that doesn't exist in the real world. It's a shame to have to use the court system to do it, but there's no uh, regulatory board setting rates. The regulators are looking at the words on the paper, not, not much at anything else. There's no protection, there's no negotiation, there's no independent review committee doing anything. So I think that's a good thing. And all I can say about class actions is it does level the playing field because for one individual to bring the case on their own, which is what you have to do in the UK, or maybe get a bunch of people in your neighborhood to sign a joint form is not very effective. It's, it's pretty tough. So um, I welcome criticisms and comments. Um, I, I was um, simply saying that there is creativity in law and there are ways to challenge uh, uh, fund governance, for example. I do the same thing in lots of other financial services areas in order to have an objective. There's nothing else I'll say. If, if nothing else, the judiciary in general are objective and they generally are unbiased. I won't name the judges who might not be said that about, but in general, they're unbiased, especially, and the best judge to get for all these cases is the judge who 10 years ago or longer was in a big firm acting for banks because they know all the tricks that the banks do. And, and they have a free of freedom of conscience now to, to right the wrongs they might have seen in practice. Those are the ones, uh, the big firms with their multi-million dollar briefs try to get away from, believe it or not. They want the law professors who, who, who they can bamboozle with thick briefs, you know, 942 authorities that they, that they go on and on about. So um, that's my... Um, legal anecdote, questions and criticisms, welcome. Paul, Paul, thank you very much indeed. That was very interesting indeed. That was a lovely, lovely series of stories there about what, what your experience has been. I, I have a question for you, if I can go first before we open it up to others. So um, in Australia, in Australia, there's been a massive Great Big Rural Commission that concluded the finance sector was riddled with conflicts of interest uh, greedy cultures, people not putting the interest of the client first, all kinds of shenanigans were going on. And it's led to massive, massive reforms. It's been a very, very painful process for Australia. In, in the UK, a couple of years ago, so three years ago, we had what was called the, the Financial Conduct Authority's Asset Management Market Study that looked at all of these issues very forensically and came to the same kind of conclusions that the, there was a lack of transparency on costs and charges, et cetera, et cetera. H has Canada had its moment yet? Do you think Canada's had or is hopefully going to have in the future some big kind of forensic look at the way the entire system works? Or is that something that needs still to be campaigned for, do you think, Paul? Uh, it, it hasn't happened, and I don't think it ever will. The Canadian banks must collectively represent 
20% of the Canadian economy. They have massive wow. political pressure at every level. Uh, I see nothing in the future to indicate there would ever be a Royal Commission on Canadian banking. Uh, there's a secondary reason I would give in a second. Uh, we're, we're, at the, we're at the solution of last resort, which is the civil litigators, you know, trying to come up with novel theories to contest uh, non-arm's length, non-negotiated, paid to my cousin payments, et cetera, based on poor disclosure. That, that, that's where we are. The other secondary reason is we have this uh, jurisdictional dichotomy between uh, um, um, federal regulation of the entities, most of them, provincial regulation of some of the transactions that they engage in, that we've overlapped in Quebec. I'm sure some of the people on this call know about that. So uh, I, I've, I've read much of the Royal Commission report in Australia. I go looking for case ideas there. Some of it is applicable to Canada, but I can only do 3,000 hours a year at this age. And so, you know, let, let there be, let there be a, a Royal Commission. I know there needs to be one in the UK, but I, I, others should speak. There's very knowledgeable people more than me. I think the chance of a Royal Commission and anything to do with banks, yeah, I, I might as well uh, win the lottery. Got it. Thank you. That's very clear, Paul. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'm going to go to John Burns because I've just glanced at the note that John put in the chat. And that's really interesting, John. Could you sort of uh, expand on, on that, elaborate on that? Because you you can clearly identify with what Paul's been speaking about. John, tell us what happened. Oh, Thank sorry. <laughs> Give well, well, Paul probably knows the, 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 the case law behind this, but uh, uh, <clears throat> a couple of decades ago, um, uh, there was a small case where an individual, I think it was a widow, asked to be able to charge extra uh, fees for in, in investment advice, and uh, the courts allowed that. And, and then overnight, basically, uh, major Canadian banks that had trust companies uh, started to uh, state quite clearly that they said, we no longer have investment uh, knowledge and expertise, so we're going to charge uh, a separate fee for investment advice. And uh, they started to uh, uh, re require existing trust documents to be uh, uh, revised under this new uh, fee structure, which basically doubled the fees. And uh, our office and I was uh, I came in there uh, to help uh, set up uh, an internal house. So we said, well, if that's going to happen, first of all, our litigation team ensued, but they didn't was successful to, to stop right. that. So every trust company now, uh, you'll have trusted fees and then you'll have investment fees. And that's, uh, you know, that's just a standard case and they'll write their contracts on that. And I'm sure Paul can uh, confer with that. But the other thing was, uh, as a planner and as a portfolio manager, we said, well, let's just bring the funds in house. Uh, we have a trustee arrangement with uh, under statute for the public trustee and uh, we'll uh, charge very small uh, costs, uh, institutional fees for our investment managers. So we still get the top investment managers on the street. And, yeah. and uh, you know, it's about $2.1 billion we, in, we manage and, but uh, it's all tied, wrapped together in nice, it's a nice little uh, pocket uh, which we, uh, by law, have to only charge 0.6% overall for all services. That includes a, a full uh, client rep who has to deal with the, the, our vulnerable client. And uh, it's a great deal. You know, so individuals uh, are literally saving millions of dollars in fees. And uh, it's uh, a working arrangement and it's, uh, it's, it's fair. Uh, if you knew what our clients get uh, daily interest on in their bank accounts, you say, oh my God, I want to become vulnerable because the, uh, the, the fees are... Uh, the, the, that extra friction in terms of costs are significant, especially on fixed income uh, vehicles and obviously on uh, international and Canadian equities as well. But if you can el eliminate one, one and a half up to 2% or more on a person's portfolio, uh, guess what? You can uh, do very well for that client. Yeah. And that's a big deal, especially when we're dealing with clients who are vulnerable and uh, uh, we are the, uh, the last, uh, uh, as trust, you know, I have a, my, uh, it's, and as a fiduciary, uh, we have to do what's in the best interest of our client. And so, anyway, it's and so it, it follows in, in sync with what I with, with what Paul was saying. It certainly does. That was very interesting as well. Thank you very much, yeah, John. Thank you. Um, and it, it's always amazing when you sort of do the math and look at how the the compounding impact of excessive fees is enormous. You know, absolutely enormous. That's why. That's why doing anything to create more transparency and to shave off any unnecessary costs is a very, very good thing to do. Well, would anybody like, else like to share a comment or a question at this point? Yes, indeed, Heliod, please do share your thoughts. Thank you. 
Yes. So the um, I recommended a royal commission in my in my book as one of the things that could be done. And uh, interestingly, shortly after that, uh, Wells Fargo in the U.S. got into trouble because uh, some of their employees were were pressured to meet targets that were extremely difficult to meet. So what they did was they created fake accounts because they had to have a certain number of new accounts, certain number of new mortgages, all the whole thing. And um, it ended up that the CEO of Wells Fargo, a huge bank, much bigger than any Canadian bank, resigned. And there was a major uh, shakeup in, in that bank. And I'm sure the other banks probably noticed that and took measures. So in Canada, some people approached the CBC News and said that we were under the same kind of pressure, existing, existing employees of Canadian banks and former employees of Canadian banks. We were under similar or even greater pressure to meet our targets to sell. And we did some amazing things that we probably shouldn't have done to uh, under that pressure to meet our targets. And um, instead of having an investigation, what happened in Canada was the regulator went to the banks and said, is this happening in your bank? And the bank said, well, we'll look into it. And so uh, shortly thereafter, a month or two later, the banks came back and said, no, no, we investigated and, and nothing like that is going on in the Canadian banks. I think that story, uh, when you look at the Royal Commission in Australia and you look at the SEC in the US and what happened in England, that story capsulizes the problem we have in Canada that, that nobody, the, the regulator is terrified of the banks. Um, as has already been mentioned, the country is divided into uh, provinces who so each have their own legislation for regulation. Yeah. Uh, but the banks are chartered, so they, they, um, they don't really recognize the provincial authority. They only recognize the federal authority. So here we have it. And, and I think the only way that we'll have a Royal Commission is if we have some major, major um, scandal or, uh, or crisis, financial crisis. And, yeah. um, but I think it would be a very good thing because we need to do something. Hilda, that was uh, extremely interesting. Um, your, your comments about Wells Fargo are really do really do resonate with me. I, I'll, I'm going to share my screen to show everybody something. You may have seen this before. I might have shown it to you before. This is um, this is a U.S. database called Violation Tracker, and it basically tracks violations. In total, there are four hundred and eighty-three thousand civil and criminal cases from more than 300 agencies with penalties of 667 billion in total. This is since the year 2000, 667 billion. Remember that figure, 667 billion. The reason why I'm asking you to remember that, that figure is because of what I'm about to show you. If you click here where it says industry totals, it's gonna take us to a ranking of how much each industry has been fined, right? And um, it may or may not surprise you to know that the financial services sector is the worst offending industry. But not only is it the worst offending industry, look at the figure, 331 billion, which is roughly half of 667. Yeah, give or take a bit, a few million, a few billion here and there. So half of the total of all the fines and infringements in the US since the year 2000 are directly attributable to the financial services industry. In other words, if you added up the financial services industry fines, 331 billion, and all the other industries put together, including oil and gas, you know, including oil and gas, um, you end up with this massive disproportional level of, of infringement. And if you then dig down a level deeper, you click on financial services, it takes you to this listing, the worst offending banks. And uh, Helia's comments about Wells Fargo are of great interest to me because uh, we got to hear about this Wells Fargo uh, making up bank accounts for exactly the reasons that Helia was explaining. Uh, the, the stock analysts were rating the value of the bank higher uh, because of the market penetration that appeared to be happening because of all these fake bank accounts being set up. And as a consequence, the chief executive, uh, uh, and I think it was $20 million over a five or six year period, directly because of the consequences of the malpractice taking on within the bank. They tried to deny it. They tried to say, we didn't know anything about this, even though they were actually sacking approximately a thousand people a year for making up the bank accounts. 
So they were blaming the staff for what was clearly a cultural thing going on throughout the whole bank. And then you've got the individual cases. And what this table shows us is that the banks are doing the same sorts of things over and over and over again. They call that recidivism. They call that recidivism. And it's a wonderful database. I'll put a link to it in the chat in a minute. And uh, if you don't know about it, then you'll know about Violation Tracker. The, the good news is we are working with the people at Violation Tracker um, and we are bringing Violation Tracker to the UK. We then want to bring Violation Tracker to Canada, to, the, to Australia, to, to mainland Europe, et cetera, et cetera. It really is a wonderful public good. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Hilliard, for, for what you said, because it uh, reminded me of the importance of that particular point. Let's go to Michaela. I can see Michaela's got her hand up. Michaela, to you, please. So, uh, yeah, that is one observation which um, this uh, the provinces and having different uh, laws in the provinces makes yeah. uh, a uniform uh, set of rules uh, very uh, hard to uh, implement and to follow. Um, I have a, I had a little anecdote. I remember in, um, in Canada, it was an interview after all of these cases in the uh, US with the SEC and the perp walk of uh, people were convicted, right? And um, the interviewer, the journalist was asking, so uh, how come that in the States in a year there were so many thousands of uh, uh, cases open mm -hmm. and out of them so many were uh, went to court and so many were convicted while in Canada it was everything was like uh, on a handful of you know like maybe 10 20 cases out of which uh, uh, maybe five were uh, went to uh, to to, uh, to court and nobody was convicted. Um, the answer of the regulator, of the Canadian regulator was, oh, well, maybe in Canada, people are more honest, which is uh, for those, I mean, for anybody knowing about statistics, you know, the, the human <clears throat> nature is not, doesn't stop at the border. Uh, the truth is that in Canada, the people in the that are supposed to watch, uh, it is the revolving door. So they are coming from banks. They are not going to pursue their colleagues, former colleagues and friends. So it is a um, community, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that. Michaela, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. The revolving door problem is a huge problem internationally. It really is. South Africa and South Korea have done things about that. They actually prohibit people leaving the regulator and going to work for a bank at a senior level for a number of years. There, there is more that can be done. Senator Warren in the US is particularly hot on this particular issue. I've just done a quick search. Let me show you this. It might be of interest to you. So I've just done a quick search in Violation Tracker uh, you can search by company name. So I just thought I'd try it. Royal Bank of Canada, just to see what comes up. So Royal Bank of Canada, uh, total fines since the year 2000 against the US authorities, the US authorities, uh, $969 million. That's quite a lot of money, isn't it? Um, for, and these are the individual cases and the individual offences. Um, it's quite a lot. It's quite a lot. It'd be interesting to see how that compares with the number of fines in Canada if the data was available. Thank you very much indeed, Michaela. Thank you. I'll, I'll put a link to that particular search in Violation Tracker into the chat as well in case you want to have a look. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to say at this point? Oh, yes, Murray, please do. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate uh, Paul's comments and uh, I just want to share with you a, an antidote uh, related to the Wells Fargo. This was a number of years ago when uh, a TD Bank bought out a trust company, Canada Trust, at that time. And I had a, a free account with Canada Trust. Interestingly enough, after the merger, I started getting statements for a new account <laughs> charges that I had never authorized them to open on my behalf. Yes. So I went into the bank actually and asked, I said, well, if I have this account, I must have signed something. Can I see the document that I signed? They went back, no trace of it at all, went through this. and. So I went back and I said, well, I'm going to invoice you for my time. So I sent them an invoice for an hour and a half, $100 an hour, sent them an invoice, 
curious what happened. I got a call about two days later from the bank manager and they said, would you like a, a check or direct deposit of that 150 into your account? So I appreciate Paul's uh, advice that you really have to push. And a lot of the, the people that we work with don't have that resilience or they're intimidated by banks. They don't know where to turn. So that leads me to my question for Paul. What do you see as, as the measure should be taken in terms of uh, revising or the uh, ombudsperson um, process that the banks have, which definitely has a conflict of interest in, the, in that funding does come from the banks? Well, I'm not a believer in the ombudsman processes. I, I wouldn't take it away because maybe there are some resolutions that are achieved and anything before litigation is good, but the, the, the internal ombudsman processes are not uh, they're, they're defensive strategies for banks to detect their own indefensible positions and bargain the way out of them cheap. Ken is extremely knowledgeable about the external um, OBC ombuds process here. And while I admire the people who run OBC, they're, they're not uh, uh, giving effective legal redress. They're not. There should be an arbitration mechanism for OBC oriented complaints, in my humble view because it's meant to be faster, cheaper, and you know, class action relief is very expensive to the public, I, 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 as it needs to be because of the costs of it and so on. So I am not a fan of the ombudsman process. My, my views you know, are to make the class action system really work. Uh, and you know, in the claims I'm doing for the return of fees, uh, you know, as I'll be telling the courts, they're only paying back what they took. We're not asking treble damages like the United States would give. You know, it's just taking, making pay back what too much they took. Well, why have sympathy for them? They wrote all the documents. Why can't they write an adequate description of what they're paying themselves to do? There should be no sympathy for them at all. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you know, maybe that'll be accepted in the judiciary. Who knows? Yeah. You know, they all look at class action lawyers as jackals tearing at the carcass of industry, but we don't eat meat. They don't fry and put up on the table. You know, and, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's a lot different than when I started 40 years ago. Uh, God, thank God the judiciary now are, are representative of society. They're, they're females, of course, as there should be. So the, the hard-ass 70-year-old who never granted a judgment in favor of a plaintiff in his career as a defense counsel and a judge, well, they're, they're not around that much anymore. They were out there when I started, and you got them on the bench, and it was tough. It was really tough. I could tell you anecdotes forever. But so I, I think it's, you know, the last class action system, I think is good. Ombudsman's, you know, unless there's binding arbitration, spare, spare me, you know. Yeah, well, I'm sure in the case of my experience with the fandom account, I'm sure there were plenty of others that would have been a great That's a great story. Action. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to we're going to bring that particular session to a close. But of course, what we'll do, first of all, is thank Paul for his session. Wonderful that was very, very, all. very informative. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Really enjoyed that. Really enjoyed that. Let's now go to our next speaker, Mr. Ken Kavenko. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ken. I can't match Paul's wonderful stories. Uh, he's my hero. He's uh, when we ask our people who's the best regulator in Canada, we we name Paul. <laughs> he's maybe the only regulator in Canada. Um, our problems, uh, we want to focus it because we, we realize we can't take on the banks. That's going to have to be uh, for another time. They're just too powerful. Um, they, you know, there's no competition. As you know, Canada doesn't let foreign banks in very easily. Uh, fees are the highest in every, every category, loans, mutual funds. I think we're the highest mutual fund fees in the world. Uh, so they're able to control it. We're not allowed to buy U.S. mutual funds, by the way, can't can't buy them. Uh, they took put that rule in. So uh, we decided we're going to do it another way. We're going to try and improve enforcement by our regulators, by harassing them and exposing them, pointing out deficiencies, making sure that all enforcement actions include investor compensation, not just fines. We want compensation. In fact, if there has to be a trade-off between compensation and fines, we want the people to get their money back. And uh, you can throw the people out of the industry. That's enough. You don't forget about the fines. Look, first, get the people their money back. The other end of the thing we want to hit them at is the other side of compensation, the complaints. The complaint system in Canada is, is uh, horrible. Uh, the rules are horrible. The development of the rules are horrible. 
uh, and the approval of the rules are horrible. Even when we quote best practices, we, we give academic studies, research, those rules still got passed by our regulators. So we we're stuck with very bad rules. Uh, but we're, we are fighting hard. Uh, we use other tactics then because we don't have big budgets to fight court cases. So we use other tactics. We do intimidation. We try to uh, file a small claims court thing. And instead of Toronto, we'll go out 150 miles you know, out of the city and file in a small town where they have to drag their lawyers up at $500 an hour. We threaten to go to the media. We have uh, websites. We write to we encourage people to file complaints on mass. Uh, so we're, we're gaining some traction, we're getting, certainly getting some attention, uh, plus a few threats to, to myself. Uh, what we uh, want is uh, a complaint system that works. We're working very hard to try and get one. We just wrote a paper on that. The Small Investor Protection Association released it uh, on Monday. Uh, I sent it to Andy, so he's got it. If you can't find it, Andy, in all your email, I'll send it again. But it's about 16 pages and goes through every aspect of complaint handling in the securities area. It would apply to banks as well. Uh, general principles of good complaint handling. And, and uh, we put that out there. And now we're going to be setting, seeing people make sure they stick, stand up to those. Uh, the other area we're working on is the try to get an ombudsman service in Canada. And, and uh, this is not uh, anything to say about with Paul. I'm talking about a real ombudsman. We have a fake ombudsman here. It's called OPSI, Ombudsman for Banking Services Investment. Uh, the industry, the banking lobbyist is allowed to nominate a director to it. So it gives you an example of what kind of ombudsman it is. Uh, all of the self-regulating organizations are allowed to nominate directors as well. Uh, and until this year, after constant threats from us, they finally installed a director who's nominally representing the retail consumer, but are just one of the 10. But the industry participant, plus they have a rule that industry participants that are retired for two years are, can join in as independent directors. So the governance is just horrible. Uh, so that's not an ombudsman, even though they use the fake term. Uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand actually make it illegal to say you're an ombudsman, at least unless you meet certain standards of independence and governance. But Canada doesn't have such a rule, of course. And we won't even mention the internal ombudsman at the banks, which are fake, fake squared. And uh, I don't, I, I'll give you an example of what they're doing to people especially uh, people of modest means and indigenous people. Uh, so we want a real ombudsman. It obviously can't even make a binding decision. So even when it makes a recommendation, uh, it, uh, it can be rejected. The trick that has been developed, the banks have learned, and the dealers that the banks own have learned that uh, they use the process that obviously has set up to defeat it. So they give the recommendation to both sides. So here's what we're gonna be recommending. Do you guys wanna do anything you know, before we issue the formal document? Well, at that point, the bank goes over and the dealer says, look, uh, we're gonna give you 30 cents on a dollar. You can have a check tomorrow for 30 cents on a dollar, go right into your bank account, you'll have it. No question. All we'll ask you to do is sign a release that you never tell anybody about this. Uh, or you can go ahead, they can put out the recommendation, but you want to make sure you understand it. We're not bound to do it. And uh, they have no power to enforce force it. And no regulator will, will take any action against us. So what do you want to do? Well, most of these people are desperate. They're already exhausted through four or five stages of the complaint. Uh, during COVID, I don't have to tell you, they are hopelessly in debt and problems. Uh, so they accept. We can't even get OPSI to release the statistics because they do know how many of these lowball settlements were, were, were done. They won't even publish that. They refuse to publish it. So we're going after uh, the government to try and set up something like the UK's financial ombudsman service, which is not perfect either, 
but uh, 30 times better than what we've got. And they do ask you by the decisions. Uh, we're talking about my get, because we help people with their complaints. So the whole of OPSI last year, this whole organization of 48 people got back about $2.1 million. Okay. And the whole industry, uh, uh, we don't know how much were rejected. I suspect that the amount that were screwed was probably four or five million. But that's not where the real problem is. We ourselves, our little group, brought back four million for people. So our little group of volunteers, we never charged for our work, got double, uh, and no one pays us anything. But we can't even handle the volume. It's just endless. I mean, we have to turn back people. Uh, why don't I give you the example of one of the um, internal ombudsman from a bank and the Bank of Nova Scotia specifically states, if you go to use them and you do get diverted to them because they don't even want you to go to OPSI, even OPSI, there's a chance they might give a settlement. <laughs> they don't even want to take that risk. So they say, use our internal ombudsman. They're as good as gold. They're an ombudsman too. So don't worry about it. So they divert. I don't know how much, probably 90% get diverted away from the real ombudsman. Uh, but they have a clause that says, once you use us, you know, you, you can't use any, if, I, if you want to get external help, you have to use a lawyer or a professional account. You, you can't use anybody else. So we said, well, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of encouraging inequality. We know people of modest means. We know people, indigenous people, new immigrants, uh, some of our native Canadians, they, they, can't, they, they can't handle this. So they can't afford a lawyer either. We want to take those cases. What right do you have to do that? You're, you're fostering inequality. Well, we're waiting for an answer for two weeks, but, but I told them this is going to be explosive. It's just one clause. There's 48 clauses of their 56 that we don't agree with. Uh, some of them are just are, are, you know, things that they won't consider, like fee abuse. They just say that's not really a complaint. That's a service issue. So there's a lot of problems there. Uh, on the bank. So we're going to fight that one and we're going to make a big example of it. Uh, they won't get us to sign any agreement though. They're either going to change it or we're going to, we're going to take them to court or do find some way to get a change. It will change. If, if we have to stage a protest and bring in buses to Bank of Nova Scotia's headquarters, we will. Uh, because that, that is outrageous. So we hope maybe we can get the indigenous people or Black Lives Matter or someone this is really hurting the poorest of the poor who cannot afford a lawyer. The average amount of the OPSI settlement, by the way, is 12,000. These are like for 4,000, 3,000, 1,800, and they still won't allow us near it. And if we get involved, we have a 98% success rate direct, and the other 2%, we won in small claims court. So you could, not that we're geniuses, because we do, we do cherry pick. The, there's so many easy ones. Why, why, you know, why go after harder ones? But it's just outrageous. I, I would estimate there's probably a billion dollars a year lost in, in those kind of uh, unfair complaint handling. In the case of complaints, complaints uh, in fees, uh, I think Paul had a good number. We estimate that in the discount brokers where they can't do any advice but are charging for it. There, there's about 25 billion, at least 25 billion, but four years ago, it's probably more than that now, of, of those kind of uh, mutual funds. So they're collecting about 1% on 25 billion, which is $250 million a year. Uh, what the regulators did in that case is after intense yelling and screaming, and I mean intense, uh, getting professors in court cases and of course, the class actions, uh, they passed a law that will outlaw those kind of payments from a mutual fund company to a discount broker in 2022, June 2022. So 20, 250 million a year. And they did this, uh, let's say they left 20 months for them to deal with it. So about 20 million a month is going down the drain. Uh, unless people get out of these things and it, some of them are sold on a deferred sales charge basis. So they have to pay a penalty. So 20 million times 20 months for no good reason. I mean, that was a clear, unethical, illegal, improper thing, charging for something you don't do. And they didn't stop it. They should have issued a cease trade order and they did not. So uh, they have till June 1, 2022. 
Same thing with the deferred sales charge. They declared it as a harmful thing after 18 years of our protests and, and billions of dollars of deferred sales charges being paid. So that's what we're up against. So the only way we found to deal with it is make them pay. And complaint handling, class actions, and enforcement actions are the way we're going to do it. That's all that's going to work in Canada. It's not the best way, but it's the only way for the Canadians to, to fight back. If anyone has a better idea, uh, I've been at it 21 years. Stan Buell, who, who's my kind of champion, who, who got rooked himself for a million before he started Small Investor Protection Association, has been at it 25 years. And we both agree this is the only way. Make them pay and embarrass and shame. Other than that, there's no, no immediate route we see for, for a better solution. So that's uh, my little pitch. Any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Ken, thank you so much. Um, we, we are learning a lot from you. We are trying to learn a lot from sure. you, for sure. I remember last week you referred to your kind of approach as being a bit like guerrilla warfare. And I, I absolutely get it. When, you've got no, when you haven't got a big resource and big collateral, you have to kind of fight tactically and, and, and try to win. Uh, we, we are learning a lot from you, Ken. We really are. Uh, la uh, yesterday, I, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to share my screen again. Myself, here's me. Um, this gentleman here is Mark Bishop. He's a very knowledgeable guy. He reminds me of Ken. Um, here we were giving evidence to Parliament about an issue to do with LCNF. LCNF is like a big scandal that's gone on. Loads of people have lost their life saving. It's, it's, it's a disaster. In fact, it was so bad, the British government got kind of into a position where they had to find a way of giving compensation to people. So they were working on this bill called the London Capital and Finance and Fraud Compensation Fund Bill. Um, so myself and Mark Bishop were giving evidence of this. And what we were able to basically say was that the government is completely wrong in thinking or pretending to believe, because there's no way they really believe it, that this London capital and finance uh, situation is particularly uh, unique. There are, there's a long list of uh, scams and scandals that are like London, co London compensation and, and, and uh, uh, the, the victims of those other schemes uh, deserve, deserve uh, compensation as well. So I'll, I'll, put that, I'll put that in the in the chat because you can go to the actual recording of it if you wanted to. Uh, if you want to watch it, it's about um, it's about an hour, an hour or so. Yeah, maybe no, about about forty five minutes. You're very welcome, of course, to watch that if you wanted to. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Ken. Let's uh, open up and see if there's anybody who would like to make a comment following on from what Ken has been saying. It looks like everyone's good, so let's please show our appreciation to Ken for sharing his thoughts with us today. Thank you very much indeed, Ken. And we're now going straight to Mr. Mike Hill. I've never heard Mike speak before. Um, but I'm looking forward to it, and I'm sure it's going to be very informative. What I really love about what Mike and his firm are doing is it's, it's part of the solution. It's about putting in place benchmarks and standards that make it easier for consumers to understand what good value for money looks like. So, Mike, over to you, sir. Thank you very much for being here, and thank you for, for spending time talking to us about your benchmarks. Thank you very much, Mike. Over to you. Cheers. Thank, thank, thank you, Andy. Um, I, I very much feel like um, I'm, I'm a square peg trying to fit into a bit of a round hole, uh, given the topic of, of, of today. And, and, and I think the, the, the broader interest in, in, in the retail sector, at least, at least in, in the group tonight. But uh, I'll share with you the Global Pension Transparency Benchmark, which is um, our firm's contribution to, to uh, transparency more broadly. Um, quick background about CM benchmarking. If you don't know, we are based in Toronto, Canada. We've been in business for 28 years. We, we don't operate in the retail space, but we help um, large asset owners, mainly pension funds, sovereign wealth funds around the world um, to, to understand their, their, their costs and to improve their performance. So we collect deep, very detailed information related to, 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 to costs um, and the value proposition uh, because, because our, our premise is, is that costs, costs alone are, are important, but the value proposition, what you're getting in return for what you're spending is, is, is very important. And, and we do that for investment operations for uh, about 15 trillion worth of, worth of assets worldwide, large asset owners. We do it for member service operations. Um, and we, we do it for uh, global, and these are our big global, uh, global services. Um, and 
transparency benchmarking is, is the most recent sort of complementary product that we that we've we've added to to what we're we're we're, we're doing. And you know, I feel like I'm probably preaching to the choir here <laughs> on this one, but but this is our take on it. Um, you know, we just believe trust is a, a critically important success factor. Um, and, and you just have to see the, you know, the importance of transparency and trust, whether it's personal relationships, it's politics, uh, it, it's corp corporations, um, and, and indeed pension, pension funds. Um, and our, our message to, to our clients and pension funds around the world is it's, it's not just the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do. Um, we really strongly believe that, that it, it leads to better outcomes for everybody in, involved. Uh, uh, transparency and accountability go hand in hand. You get improved clarity of purpose. You get much better relationships uh, across a broad spectrum of, 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 of stakeholders and ultimately better outcomes for, for pension fund members. We did this in, in partnership with um, an Australian media organization, Top 1000 Funds. And if you're not familiar with them, they're, they're, they, they, they publish um, an e-magazine and have related sort of conference and communication media services that, that cater to um, large asset owners um, ar around the world. So they're the media partner. CEM is the is the benchmarking partner. So so we develop the, the the framework for evaluating global pension transparency uh, in, in pension funds. We, we did it by reviewing the public disclosures um, of the five largest pension management organization across fifteen countries. Um, so again, we we didn't ask any questions directly. Um, of these organizations, it was simply what did they disclose in, 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 in terms of what we felt were, were, were key disclosures that, that they should disclose to explain what they're doing and communicate their value proposition to, to, their, to their stakeholders. And if anybody is, uh, is interested in, in learning more, there's a wealth of information on the, the Top 1000 website. You can see the, the, the link there. So there's, there's a wealth of information um, about the service and the outcomes. This is the framework we developed. Um, we've got a long history of um, benchmarking costs and, and, and performance for, for large asset, asset owners. So we sort of came by, by that honestly and, and, and naturally. Uh, and, we, and we've done some governance and organizational work for um, some of our larger clients over the past num number of years. So, so we, we leaned on that. Uh, responsible investing was a, was, a, was a new area for us, but it's, it's, I think it should be obvious to, to everybody that this has become a, a, a key component of the value proposition. Um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a wave that will continue to, to grow. That's obvious from, from our client, client base and, and from uh, you, you, anything, anything you see or, or read or, or hear about in, 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 the, in the pension investing space and across society in general. So we added it. There was 188 separate uh, disclosures that we were looking for uh, across this framework that we felt that, that all pension funds, regardless of the type of fund, regardless of the regulatory in, in, in environment, their membership base, et cetera, should be reporting that we were looking for. Um, th these are the 15 countries that, that we, we, we targeted, um, we wanted to make it global. So there's at least one from every continent. Um, we would like to have done more, but there was a, a large quantum of work uh, in, involved and we're a relatively small private company to, 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 to do the work. And, but you know, many of the, of, of the most robust pension markets around the world are, are represented. Um, the Canadian group is, 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 is the five largest pension management organizations in Canada, and I've, I've, I've listed them there, British Columbia Investments, the, the Case de Depot, CPP Investments, Ontario Teachers, and PSP Investments, which manages the, um, the, basically the military and the civil service uh, for, the, for the Canadian 
Canadian government. And, and what were the results? This is extracted from um, the top 1000 website and it's the country level re results. Canada actually rank first overall with an average country score of, of 74. Um, the dark blue bars are, are the um, average scores across the countries and they're just uh, organized alphabetically here. Um, individual Canadian funds uh, the scores range from 69 to, to, to 82. So, so they all scored relatively highly. Um, the, the, the range in, in terms of individual funds around the world was, was really extreme. Um, and, and for example, you, you, you know that the, the top Canadian, the light blue bar for Canada was, was 82 out of, out of 100. Um, Mexico, the, the, the lowest was, 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 was 18. And, and you can see that there's a wide differences in the, in the nature and extent of the disclosures by, by country. Um, Canada was, was, was first. Again, the Netherlands was, was a close, close, close second, followed by Sweden and Australia. Um, Canadian funds ranked uh, highly in all factors. They were, they were only number one in, 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 in one, and that's governance. And uh, that's something that I think gets, gets a lot of, has received a lot of press over the years relate, related to the strength of the governance system for, for, for large Canadian public sector uh, pension funds. So perhaps not surprisingly, um, their governance disclosures were very strong and they scored highly. Um, the, the, they, were, they were also scored highly on, on the other measures, but were not the best. The Netherlands was, was, the, was the strongest for, for costs. Responsible in investing was uh, the Swedish were the best, and and uh, Northern Europe uh, were, were five of the top seven uh, positions. Um, responsible investing was very strong in some countries and was um, almost absent in in terms of what was being reported. There was, there were a few scores of zero. In fact, there there was nothing for for some funds. Um, the framework focused on what was disclosed. So it was very quantitative and, and a yes, no, do you disclose a, a long-term rate of return or, 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 or not for, 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 for example. Um, but as part of the process, and, and you can see uh, lots of examples that we've uh, highlighted on the top 1000 site, um, we look for best practice examples. And the Canadian funds did have, have, have many of these. Um, so, so going well beyond what was strictly what is being disclosed to, to um, create narratives around what we do and why we do things this way and how we do, do, do things, um, which was not all that common um, in, 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 in terms of those communication quality type uh, best, best practices. So that's a whirlwind tour, happy to entertain questions or a broader discussion. Thank you very much indeed. That was, that was extremely interesting. Um, John Burns put a couple of points into the chat, so I think it makes sense to invite John to, uh, to, to elaborate on his question. John, over to you. Thank you. Oh, oh thank you, Andy. Yeah, no, I, I love this the talk, Mike. Uh, the, the key concern I have, obviously, I, I kind of very uh, walk on both sides, both institutional as, as well as serving uh, retail because so many Canadians, and I guess it's around the world, are losing their access, especially as employees, to pensions, i.e. defined benefit plans, defined contribution plans, uh, those high levels of disclosure and fiduciary responsibilities, et cetera, they, they lose that they, because now they're having to deal with the retail side. So when you mentioned that you might have been a square <laughs> peg in a round to try to get into a round hole, I would think that just the opposite, that would make sense that this high level that has been so has been so expertly uh, uh, navigated over the, the many 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 years that pensions have been uh, around. How would that? How could that filter down into the retail? Because in fact, we end up it is the same person, 
So if someone no longer has a company pension plan, they still need to obviously do some significant planning for their uh, future retirement needs. And, uh, and I would think that the, uh, many retailers, uh, clients are being left to uh, their own devices. And anyway, that's something. Um, yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, and believe me, I'm not saying that the, 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 the pension space globally is, 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 is perfect or even stellar. No. There is tremendous room for improvement there. It, it's, it's uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell one anecdote that, that, that somebody several years ago, uh, uh, a staff members at CalPERS, California Public Employees Re Retirement System, was asked by a board member, um, well, how much are we paying for our private equ equ equity, equity program? Um, well, I don't know exactly what we're paying. Well, they were paying um, close to a billion dollars for, for, the, for the cost of the program. And, and you've got somebody in, in, a, in, a, in a public meeting who can't say how much they're, they're paying and they're spending public money, a billion dollars of public money on this one, on this one program. So there's lots of improve, room for improvement in the pension fund space and other asset owner space or, or around the world. I, I, I don't know if there's any accountants in the room, but but they're partially the, the accounting frameworks and account and accounting bodies are partially culpable for this because the standards are are are, are, are vague um, and not as demanding as they should be in general around the world. And you're you're quite right. The same principles should apply to the retail space where the problem is is bigger. Um, and, and, you know, I, I guess the message I, I, I give to all of our clients, and, and some of them are enlightened enough, I, I, I think, to, 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 to volunteer it, is any financial institution would be far better off if, if, if they bought in um, and em em embrace transparency be, 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 because, it's, it, you know, it's, it's just something that is better for them. It's, it's the right thing to do. It's a smarter thing to do long term. I found that very interesting indeed. Um, in the UK, more and more people are getting involved with master trusts, which are effectively, a, as, as you'll no doubt know, Mike, a cluster of um, people's pension funds. And that really is helping to drive down costs a great deal rather than relatively expensive individual personal pension plans. Um, that's exactly the kind of efficiency that could hopefully migrate from the institutional market to the retail market. I'm, I'm genuinely uh, surprised that Canada is, is relatively so good on the, on the kind of workplace pension side, given how expensive its retail sector is. I'm, I'm pleased to see that. It's, it's an amazing dichotomy. It is. It is. It, it's, really, it's a, it really, really, really is because we're amongst the highest in the world, arguably on the on the retail side in, yeah. in, in terms of cost and fee structures, and uh, principally because the, our, our larger uh, uh, public pension funds have internalized so much of their operations. We're, we're uh, re relative yeah. to the to the sophisticated asset mix that they that that, that they do employ. Uh, they operate quite efficiently. One one of the um, one of the shenanigans, or if you like, dirty tricks of the trade, if I can put it that way, that we come across in the UK sometimes, is when there'll be a a company pension scheme, but the individuals are actually going into a retail investor charging structure. Yeah, which is like horrific. You know, there's no justification for that at all. And we do come across that from time to time. That's when the company is absolutely um, taking the mick, as we would say in the UK. Totally unfair, totally irrational, completely unjustifiable for a company pension scheme to be set up on a retail charging structure. Nightmare, absolute nightmare. There's a great question from Hilliard about green, green investing. Uh, Hilliard, why don't you bring that question to life and, and put it to Mike, please? Uh, he, he may well have a, some insights on that. And then we'll go to Murray's question as well about PayPal, Amazon, Google, and all the other major tech organizations. But let's go to Hilliard first of all. Thank you, Hilliard. So I was, uh, I've been watching the, um, I guess the other way to put it is rather than investing in renewables is um, the more what you see is, is uh, pressure to divest of fossil fuel. <clears throat> and, um, and of course, Canada is extremely vulnerable in this area because um, a big percentage, second only to the banks. And of course the banks are by far the biggest but second to that is the energy sector, which is almost all fossil fuels in Canada uh, for investors. 
Um, and if the pension plans were to be forced to divest from fossil fuels, uh, it would have a big impact on the Canadian financial markets and also the Canadian banks because you know, it's not just the pension plans, but also there's another movement to go after the banks for financing fossil fuel uh, projects. So I wondered if, if, if uh, great presentation, by the way, uh, Mike, and uh, I wondered if he's seen any uh, growing uh, pressures in, that, in those areas. Oh, um, ab absolutely. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I no, Northern, it, it, it varies around the world. I, I would I would say northern 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 Europe is in the vanguard, uh, and it's obviously so important uh, across their the, 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 all of society that there that that it's just uh, enmeshed in in the in, in the pension programs. They're they're very far advanced, and they're you know they're reporting um, not, not only on 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 how they're implementing things or, or doing flag waving things, they're actually re reporting a lot on outcomes, you know, specific impact investing programs, um, exclusion uh, programs and, 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 and uh, activity, uh, activism uh, pro programs with the companies they, they in, 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 in invest in. Uh, other parts of the world are a little slower. Um, Canada and the U.S. Um, somewhat slower, but very, very clearly, it's 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 coming, and and I I I think people should not bury their heads in the sand on 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 on, the, on this one, because if, if they're not, I believe if they're not proactive and smart about it, uh, it'll be forced upon them uh, e eventually. That was a very good exchange. There was a an interesting development in the U.K. market roughly three maybe three and a half years ago where the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries uh, decreed that uh, it was no longer acceptable for pension funds to not consider climate change risks. Um, so that was great. That was a massive progress, a massive step forward, because it meant that all the actuaries advising all the major pension funds had to start kind of um, getting the pension funds to think about the true uh, risks associated with high carbon industries and all that kind of thing. Um, hopefully, you'll, if you haven't already had that kind of thing, you'll start having that over there in Canada as well. Thanks, Mike. It's been a really interesting talk. Uh, Murray's put a question which I can really identify with here because when you were talking about how good the institutional market was in Canada, I started thinking to myself, well, surely that's a massive commercial opportunity for nimble new agile players so if you don't mind john please uh, bring your question to life about paypal amazon google etc uh, starting oh. to take a slice of the market in canada what, what are your thoughts around that please well i think the uh, the, the various uh alt banks i we in canada we have uh, coho mogo other uh, online services uh really are presenting very low cost alternatives the only issue is that they need uh uh, an online practice, right? You need high speed internet and uh, the, so, so I know I'm working with a consortium where we're trying to uh, deal with, there's a, there within the federal government, it, you may not know this, that the, uh, the, 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 the feds have a program that will allow um, low income communities to get high speed internet uh, for $9.99 a month. Uh, so if they have that, and they have access to uh, uh, these uh, these financial uh, mediums, uh, whether it's a like a Well Simple, which is like a robo advisor or a Coho or Mogo. They have their uh, their services. It's uh, low cost. They're relatively free. They this it 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 also uh, pulls that individual away from using uh, payday loans and uh, obviously the uh, uh, pay uh, buy now pay later programs, but. Uh, Again, it's uh, uh, I don't see the banks necessarily uh, fitting in there because they have their legacy uh, platforms. But I think the uh, one thing we've learned through COVID over the last year is how much we can do without having to uh, leave leave our homes. And and it's a it's a, and and I you know I mean every one of us has uh, has been operating uh, our businesses from uh, uh, remote locations. And, uh, you know, the security issues and other issues using your VPNs and other networks, you know, for the most part has stay, have stayed intact. So, you know, I don't think uh, anyone's ever going to go back, but 
that great divide, you know, I call it the digital divide, uh, is still there. And there is mm -hmm. just alone in, in Canada, we have uh, hundreds of millions, I would say billions of people still are not uh, properly uh, set up for uh, to move on this. Thank you. Murray, Mike, any comments on that? I, 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 don't, I don't know that I'm the best person in the room to, 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 to speak to that, so I'd open it up to the floor. Yeah, let's go to Hilliard, because Hilliard put a very interesting comment in there about Elon Musk. I had not realised that Elon Musk is, uh, uh, was, was uh, kind of migrating from PayPal to uh, Tesla, SpaceX, etc. I didn't know he, he, he had that background in PayPal. I, I guess I should have done. H Hilliard, do you think there's a chance that there's going to be uh, a taking of market share by new, nimble di digital players in, in Canada? It seems like there could be, but... There are some major obstacles. The, the payment system is a very jealously guarded um, uh, system that is that the the government is reluctant to share too widely. So they've confined it in Canada to six big banks program. I mean, there's other people that can get in, but it's very difficult to uh, be part of that system. And uh, and so uh, the the uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why why uh, Elon Musk decided to uh, get out of PayPal, which was going to be a disruptor, because he found that when, when you got up against the banks, there were ma major obstacles that, that would keep PayPal as a fringe player rather than a central player. But I think he also decided that it was more important to electrify the world and get rid of fossil fuels. Mm. So in his mind, it was, uh, I'm guessing, that uh, that was the more important disruption. But I'm sure if he'd stayed with PayPal, he actually would have found a way to disrupt the banks. But I actually also believe that the banks might have prevailed even against a genius like Elon Musk. Uh, whereas the car companies are not going to prevail. Elon Musk is going to win that battle. I think in the case of he, if he tried to disrupt the banks with PayPal, I think he might have lost that. And maybe he maybe he realized that because the governments just don't want, uh, you know, it's, it's such a delicate system. And, and, and when a crisis comes, um, the government and the banks are very much uh, tied at the hip and they're in the same boat together and they help each other out in a way that um, just can't be done with a bunch of fringe players spread all across the system. So creating true competition in the financial services industry is going to be very difficult. Uh, the cartel will probably prevail for quite a long time. Very, very interesting indeed. Mr. Brathway, I know you want to make a point. Go for it, sir. Yeah, because um, uh, I think I have a, a bit of a unique uh, position here being at a, a big bank now. And I actually started my career after I graduated from U of T Economics at the Canadian Repository for Securities. Um, I was uh, uh, actually uh, the relationship manager for CEDAR, um, kind of liaison between the CSA and which is our Canadian securities administrators and um, the filing issuers. And traditionally the Canadian Repository for Securities, which is the uh, clearinghouse for all, you know, stock transactions and what have, you was created by the banks and was actually a nonprofit owned jointly by, by the banks until literally the year that I joined in 2012, it was acquired by the TMX group, which is the Toronto Montreal Exchange. So as you can see there, like the system was created by the banks uh, as been kind of um, noted previously created by the banks and then you know regulated by the banks um, in a framework that the government kind of allowed um, and then now it's, you know, clearinghouse with the stock exchange at TD, there's things I can't talk about, but at the same time, you know, during this crisis, uh, they were leading, he leading heavily on the banks for um, funding a lot of the uh, programs that they put in place to, you know, help Canadians, what have you. So, um, you know, to others points, I, I don't see that relationship breaking and I, and I definitely see the government kind of um, protecting that relationship because it's in their best interest. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much indeed. It looks to me like there's going to be, it's going to take a long time before there's any significant change in the banking sector. <clears throat> I think Murray's got his hand up. Murray, yeah? Yes, just in follow up to, to my question about that, certainly some of the disruptors, um, they've set up in the US or are in the process of setting up. So it'd be interesting to see. My, my hope is that they don't run into the same sort of blocking by the banks that the uh, uh, telecommunications industry has, has been able to effectively block competition too. And, and the point was made um, 
in terms of having high speed internet access. And of course, that disproportionately affects lower income people who cannot afford the high cost of internet too. So the two are very much correlated in terms of the impact on their ability to access banking services or at least low cost banking services. So yeah. my, 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 my prediction is that they may be able to delay it, but I think the competition is inevitable at some point as we move more to a, a completely electronic system. Thank you very much indeed, Murray. And let's uh, show our appreciation to Mike for his uh, talk. It's inspired quite a bit of conversation there as well. So Mike, thank you very much indeed. And um, I'm very keen, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, to guide you into a close at on time. It's uh, pretty much exactly the, the uh, published uh, ending time. Uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. I genuinely have learned a lot about the dynamics in Canada. Uh, we've heard from Paul, we've heard from Ken, we've heard from Mike. There's been a lot of conversation amongst us as well. Um, thank you very much indeed for spending a couple of hours with me and with each other. I really do hope it's been of some interest and value to you. Okay, looks like everyone's happy. That's good. It's one in the morning here. I don't know what time it is where you are because you're all in different places, but uh, I, at, no, <laughs> at, at no point have I felt kind of uh, jaded or tired. It's been genuinely very interesting. I'm extremely grateful to you all for spending some time with us. Thanks especially to the speakers. Uh, please engage with the TTF. We're trying to do the best we can with not much resource. And uh, the more people we have, the better. Thank you all very much indeed. Enjoy the rest Thank of your you. day. Great Thank to meet you. everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.